court recognize the Honorable Michael Snipes on behalf of the state. Sir, this is your jury. You may proceed when ready. Please support the counsel for defense, my esteemed colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the evidence in this case is going to show the following. On April 29, 2017, at exactly 11.18 p.m. and 37 seconds, this man, Roy Durwood Alder, murdered, shot in the back of the head, an innocent kid named Jordan Devon Edwards, nickname was Smiley. Shot him in the back of the head at the intersection of Barron Drive and Shepherd, Ball Springs, Texas, a small town of approximately 25,000, located 16.1 miles southeast of this very courthouse. Jordan was a 15-year-old ninth grade student Beloved by his family, beloved by his classmates, beloved by his teachers, and beloved by his coaches. He was an innocent child doing nothing wrong whatsoever that night. Police officers have very dangerous jobs. They have to make split-second decisions. They have to make decisions that are extremely important. We stand beside police officers every single day in this courthouse. Some of my best friends are police officers. Most of them do an outstanding job, and I'm proud to serve with them. But that is not what happened on the night of April 29, 2017. The defendant, Roy Oliver, was angry. He was out of control. He was dangerous. He was stomping up and down the road. He was trigger happy, and he was completely totally unreasonable and out of line. That conduct resulted in the murder and death of an innocent 15-year-old child who did not have to die and should not have died. The way this case unfolds started out innocently enough. During the week before April 29th, which was a Saturday, a teenager Came to Norris Roads, found out his parents were not going to be out of town on Saturday. So guess what? He decides, as people have been doing for decades, it's I myself did in high school. Party time. We're going to have a party. So they advertised this party throughout all of the five high schools that are in the ski. That's going to be North of the ski, West of the ski. Corn, mesquite, petite. They advertised by way of Snapchat and Instagram. Big party is going to be at 12304 Barron Drive. And this kid, Jordan Evers, finds out about this party. He's 15 years old. He's excited. He's starting his life. He's going to be a young man soon. He goes to his brothers who are two of his best friends. One's named Vidal Allen. He's his stepbrother, but you're going to learn that they're closer than most blood brothers are. You'll learn that. His other brother, Devon Edwards, both of whom are older than Jordan, and he convinces them this party would be a blast. Let's go talk to Dad, Odell Edwards, and get permission to go. Odell Edwards knows that he's got good kids, that they're not going to cause him trouble. He trusts them. Nevertheless, he gives them the same instructions he does any time those young men go out together. No drinking, no drugs, stay out of trouble, get home in a reasonable hour. Odell Edwards believes in those kids. They believe in him. And he even gives them his 2004 Chevrolet and Power to drive that night. Black Chevrolet and Power. So at about 9 o'clock that night, they get together along with two of their best friends, twins Maximus and Maxwell Everett, and the five of them pile into their Chevrolet and Power and decide to go to this party. These guys live over in Mesquite. The party is actually in Bald Springs, but they're side by side towns, not very far. So the dialogue is the driver of the car. He's 16 at the time. The 
passenger to his right is this kid, Jordan Javon Evans. Behind Jordan in the car is Maximus Everett. In the middle, behind, is Kavon Edwards. Behind the doll Allen is Maximus' twin, Maxwell Edwards. They go over, they stop, at, I can just see it now, a convenience store, just being kids. They stop, they get snacks, they get some juice. They're ready to go. They get to the party, and by the time they get there, it's already extremely crowded. They can't park in front of the, in front of the building, in front of the house. They have to park on the southeast side of Barron Drive, right at the corner of Shepherd, which is the North South Road, and Barron. This will become an important place. They go into the party at about 9, 9.30. There's a $2 cover charge for boys, $1 for girls. You'll learn that uh, there's absolutely no explanation for those cover charges because there was no food or refreshment at this party. <laughs> and for the next two hours, they had somewhere between 150 and 300 kids at this party. It was amazingly packed. And you know what those kids were doing at that party? They weren't gang banging. They weren't beating each other up. They weren't causing trouble. They were having fun. They were playing rap music and they were dancing. These are teenagers. There were a lot of young women there. I'm sure there was a lot of flirting going on. They were having a good time. Nothing bad whatsoever. But at about 11 o'clock, some of the neighbors decided that the party was getting too noisy. Some of the cars that people had driven to the party were blocking the driveways. They make a 911 call to the Ball Springs Police Department at exactly 11 o'clock. Two officers respond to the scene of that party. One of them is Officer Tyler Gross. His beat is 63. And you'll hear that in body cams that are going to be admitted in this case. The defendant also arrives. His beat is 64. And you'll hear that in both of their body cams. These body cams will be extremely important in this case. Body cams will be corroborated by ten witnesses, the four kids in the car, and six witnesses on the ground. And the witnesses will corroborate the body cams. And that corroboration each way is very important. The officers arrive at about 11.06 p.m. They activate their body cams. At exactly 11.13.15, you first see on the defendant's body cam, the kids coming out of the house. Why are they doing that? Well, lights and sirens, they know it's time to go. One or more of the kids might even say that they use the term 12, which means the police are going, it's time to go. But as they're leaving, they're not causing any problems with the police, and quite frankly, the police are not causing any problems with them. So they're streaming out of the house to go. At 11.15 and 45 seconds, Officer Gross will testify in this case, and the defendant will go into the house and find out that it's Denars Rhodes' party at this place. And so they're talking to him. Mr. Rhodes, there's too many people here. What's going on? Rhodes responds at one point, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Uh, Officer Gross is kidding around with one of the kids, calls him Hamburg. It's a very pleasant exchange. A lot of yes, sir, no, sir. Finally, Officer Grove says, I don't want to see this again. Denar says, it's a one-time thing, sir. We didn't expect it to be like this. But no problems at all. Everybody's leaving the party. That all changes at exactly 11, 17, and 43 seconds. Twelve shots ring out into the night from the Ball Springs Rehabilitation Center located approximately 150 yards to the east, just on the other side of Shepherd Lane. Those 12 shots are eight 9 millimeter shots and four 40 millimeter shots. You'll hear testimony about that. When that happens, Officer Gross and the defendant 
decided to go investigate the source of those shots. Officer Groves proceeds on foot walking up the hill towards Shepard. It's about maybe 100 yards away. He's walking up the hill. He's trying to get control of the situation. He's trying to get cars to stop. While he's doing that, moving to the east, the defendant goes to his patrol car. His patrol car is facing to the east. In front of his patrol car is Officer Gross's patrol car. That's also important because those two cars parked on Barron Drive block the access. People can't go through there and have to go in the opposite direction as a result of that. When the defendant goes to his patrol car, he grabs his MC5 carbine rifle, capable of firing AR-223 rounds. Exactly 11, 18, and 10 seconds p.m., the defendant chambers an AR-223 round, and he begins to follow along the side of the gross. Behind the gross, rather. 11, 18, and 23 seconds is the first time that you will see the Chevrolet in power. It's backing up on the road, away from Officer Gross, away from the defendant, not towards him, away from him. Backing up, going towards the Shepard. You see, what had happened was the Dial Allen, the driver of the car, had moved a little forward to the west on Barron, hoping to go out that way, but it's blocked by the police car. So he has to back up. It's the only thing he can do. So he backs up. He'll testify that he's backing up very carefully, very slowly, doing exactly what Odell Edwards and Charmaine Edwards had always told us kids to do. Be careful, be safe. At exactly 11, 18, and 28 seconds, you will see on the defendant's body cam that he begins to run. He begins to run towards what's ultimately his firing position. His firing position is at the intersection of Barron Drive. And, Chairman. and your honor, at this point, we need to object on, on matters we brought to the court's attention earlier on uh, regarding the United States Constitution, Fifth Amendment, and Article 1, Section 19 of the Texas Constitution. Does the court will call objections? I, I do. Those objections are overruled. I'll give yeah, you a running you. objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Snipes. Shortly after 11, 18, and 28 seconds, various witnesses are going to tell you that the defendant had already made up his mind that he was going to shoot. He raises his rifle to his shoulder firing position, the position in which ultimately he engages that car and kills Jordan Edwards by shooting him in the back of the head. Meanwhile, Tyler Gross is trying to get Dahl Allen, his Chevrolet and Tyler, to stop. They don't stop. Dahl Allen will candidly and truthfully admit to you that he did hear Officer Gross telling him to stop, but that he was so terrified, so scared, he'd been told to leave the party. He just wanted to get out of there, but he did not stop his car. Instead, once he uh, come to a stop position, exactly 11, 18, 33 seconds, he decided to proceed south. Not at a high rate of speed, and certainly not towards Gross or the defendant at any time. You will hear significant testimony about that including from Officer Groves. Somewhere around 11-18-34 or 11-18-35, Jordan Edwards says the last three words he's ever going to say in his life. Words of warning to his brothers and his buddies. Words that might well have saved one or more of them. A heroic last act. He yells, duck, get down. Duck, get down. And that's what they all do. As a result of that, Jordan turns his head, the evidence will show. And the round finally hits. As a result of him turning his head, it hits him in the back of the head, right there, on the right side. At 11, 18, and 36 seconds, Officer Gross reaches the Chevrolet and Powell. He goes towards the Chevrolet and Powell, not vice versa. He goes to the right rear tire of that car. He's not in front of the car. He's in no danger whatsoever. 
and he tries to get the Dahl Island driver's attention. He raps on the right rear window and it accidentally breaks it out. That happens at exactly 11, 18, 36 seconds. Point three five eight seconds left. After that glass is broken, the first shot is fired. And all five shots are fired, all within point nine three four seconds. The first shot is relatively harmless. It hits in front of Jordan, perpendicular. The ball was firing position at the intersection of Barron and Shepard. It's perpendicular, it skips across the windshield. You'll see two defects, one in front of Jordan and one in front of the dial. But then, all within one second, 0 0.934 be exact, a second shot's fired. And this shot is the shot that kills an innocent kid named Jordan Evans. Kills him instantly, goes into the back of his head, and destroys his brain. You'll hear evidence that all five of these shots, all of them, including the first one, were fired after the Chevrolet and Pala had already cleared past Tyler Rose. No danger whatsoever, none. But the murdering spree continued. <clears throat> Even after the car passes the defendant as well, who was situated just a little bit to the south Officer Gross, he continues to fire. He turns on a 45 degree angle to the southeast and fires three more rounds. There will be evidence of all of that, and you'll see. Again, all five rounds fired after that car has passed Officer Gross. No danger. No reasonable police officer, you'll hear testimony, would have engaged that car. No way. The kids now panic. The doll figures out fairly quickly that Jordan's been hit. The sadness begins to set in and the panic and the fear. They drive two roads over to Bishop Lane. They make a right going back to the west. They don't know what to do. They're teenagers. They're kids. Meanwhile, Officer Jeremy Chandler, acting very honorable, deploys over to Bishop. He's heard the first call of shots fired. He thinks that he has to do a felony stop because he doesn't know what exactly has transpired up by the nursing home. You're going to hear evidence that those 12 shots were fired by a man named Tupac. That's his street name. His real name is DeMichael Rose. And I'm going to tell you how you're going to hear that in a moment. You're also going to hear that all 12 of those shots were fired after the five kids were already in the car so that none of them could possibly have been involved in any of that. The Chevrolet Impala goes over to Bishop and he flags down one of the kids in the back, likely Maximus, flags down Chandler. They know that their brother their best friend is hurt and maybe dying. They actually flag him down to ask for help. But poor Chandler, poor Officer Chandler, he can't do anything about it right now because he doesn't know what's happening. So he has to treat it as a felony stop. And the significance of that is he has to wait for other officers to come down to Bishop so that he can have cover and get those kids out of the car. Eventually, the defendant an officer named Pedro Gonzalez, another officer named Jeffrey Baldwin, arrive to assist Officer Chambly. And they begin to pull the kids out of the car. They have to walk backwards as they're coming out with their hands up. The kids are terrified. You'll hear them. Please don't hurt. Please don't hurt. My brother. My brother, he's dead in here. He's dead in here. Please don't hurt. Each one of those four kids are marched out of those cars, the first two by Officer Chambly, the latter two by uh, Officer Baldwin and Officer Taylor Collins. All four of those kids 
were placed on their knees and handcuffed. And separated. Eventually, Pedro Gonzalez tells the defendant to check for the pulse of Jordan Edwards. And there is none. You will remember that the defendant has already fired five rounds. You can hear testimony that he would have had gunpowder residue on his hands as a result. And you're going to hear testimony that in all likelihood that gunpowder residue was transferred to Jordan's hands at 11.50 on Jeremy Chambly's dash cam. We'll see it. You're going to hear uh, evidence and testimony that all of the defects in that car were from shots fired from outside the car, not from inside the car. You're going to find that there were no guns found because those kids didn't have any guns. Jordan didn't even know how to shoot anything besides maybe a pellet gun, his father told me. No guns, not doing anything wrong whatsoever. You're going to hear testimony that all five of these kids, none of them were drinking. None of them were using drugs. They were just having a good time. Jordan Edwards dies for having a good time. Murder the back of the head. So how am I going to prove all this to you? Well, here's how. First, we're going to have the body cams of the defendant and Tyler Rose. Those will be shown to you. You'll be able to see them on the screens. And then we're going to have the four kids in the car tell you what happened. The doll will tell you. Frank, that he heard Officer Gross tell him to stop, that he didn't because he was terrified. It's also going to tell you, and you're going to see video evidence of this, that he never tried to hit Officer Gross, and in fact what he did was he steered to the left. And you'll see this. And he was actually over the center line, and ultimately ends up in what would be the northbound lane, all the way over, going out of the way to not hit either one of these officers. That's what you'll hear from the four kids in the car. They'll tell you about the gun getting down, too, and how they did that. And then, fortunately for us, in the parking lot at night, facing to the west, our best friends, Jeremy Seaton and Eric Knight. And both of them do two very significant things. First, Jeremy Seaton sees a bunch of kids drive up in a white minivan into that parking lot at the Ball Springs Rehabilitation Center. And he sees them jump out of the car and he sees them posturing and beginning to shoot into the air. And miraculously, for this case, Jeremy Seaton recognizes Tupac as the main shooter. He recognizes him because Jeremy Seaton used to work at a mall that Michael Rose is his real name. He used to freak he sees him immediately. He knows who it is. The other thing that Jeremy Seaton does is he can tell you that he knew Jordan from Pee Wee football. He actually played with Jordan. And he knew that Jordan Edwards, nor anyone else in the car, had anything to do with those 12 shots that were fired in the night. He'll tell you that. His partner, his best friend, football player, we're going to get him out of football practice putting him down here. College. He saw this too, and he also knew Jordan Edwards because he, and his name is Eric Knight. Eric Knight's little brother played Pee Wee football with poor Jordan. So Eric knew him, and he'll also be able to testify that Jordan Edwards or any of those other kids were over there shooting, causing trouble over there in the rehabilitation center. You remember that I told you that. Five shots were fired by the defendant. What else will we hear about that? You're going to hear from Tyler Gross that he never felt in fear for his life, the one that all of us supposedly were taking. He never felt in fear for his life, and that's why he didn't even consider firing this weapon. And he knows now, after reviewing the body cams of the car, he's moving away from it. You'll also hear, right after those shots are fired, this man right here, the old Brooks. You all right? Rose says, yeah, I'm fine. Response, well, he was trying to hit you. Now, that's important. 
for this reason. It means that, he's, that uh, he can't say that he said at the time he was trying to hit me or that I was startled by the blast breaking out. Remember this. It was this. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. He was trying to hit you. Seton and Knight will also tell you that they saw the murder. They saw two things. They saw the people shooting over in the nursing home. And they also saw the murder. And Seton's going to tell you that he saw the defendant Oliver running up that hill, raising his rifle, getting ready to go to his firing position so that he could shoot into that car for those five teenage kids. Over on the west side of the murder are three other witnesses. Leandre Henderson, Gordon Patterson, and Quincy White. And they're going to tell you that they saw all or part of all of this, depending on which witness it is. Quincy White and Jordan Patterson will tell you that the defendant, Oliver, was raising his weapon up as he ran to his firing position. Ultimately, the use of force expert that we're going to bring in this case, Dr. Phil Taylor, is going to tell you that it's his opinion, to a reasonable degree of certainty, that the defendant had made up his mind to engage those kids before he ever even got up there. So that's three witnesses there. Now we got five, plus the 400 cars, nine. But then to the north, we got a guy named Reggie Mickens, about 10 years younger than me, had gone to get a pizza for his wife. He's driving south on Shepard. You'll see his headlights in uh, Tyler Rose's body cam. He's behind the car, and very excitedly and very worriedly, he sees this and calls his wife to tell her about it. He's going to tell you that the defendant Oliver was stomping mad, stomping up and down the road. He knew immediately that something really bad had happened. He was scared and he was angry about something bad had happened and he was excited. And so he called up his, his wife to say something horrible just happened. Some cop just did something really bad. Somebody's hurt. So that's those witnesses there. Police officers Jeremy Baldwin, yeah, yeah, Baldwin. Jeremy Chamblin, Pedro Gonzalez, and you okay? Um, or they'll tell you about what they did. Quite frankly, they all behaved just fine. The only person who didn't is this man, the defendant, Roy Turtle at all. We're going to have a ballistics expert come in and testify to you about the 12, 12 rounds that were fired from the Rehabilitation Center. I'll tell you that it's 8, 9 millimeter rounds, 4, 40 millimeter rounds. It's going to tell you about the four cartridges that they obtained from the defendant's firing position. That those were AR-223 rounds, case detection. I'm going to tell you all about the testing that was done on those. I have a gunpowder transfer expert testify. The findings were consistent with gunpowder residue being found on the left hand of George Edwards. Very possibly, she'll say, having been transferred from the defendant to the reach into the car. And that's the only logical explanation because there were no guns in that car, no firings inside that car. You'll hear that. The medical examiner will tell you that Jeremy Chandley does not have anything to worry about as far as could he have acted faster before Jordan was killed instantly. And he's going to tell you that. He's going to tell you it was a homicide. Then we have another expert named Nick Webb. He's going to tell you how he finally figured out where the fifth shot hit him by doing an examination of Chevrolet and Powell and finding out that that round had ricocheted off the ground and hit the undercarriage of the car. You're going to have a forensic video analysis guy and Grant Fredericks is going to come from Spokane, Washington. And what he did was he made measurements using reverse projection, 3D analysis, and he took these two body cams and he put them side by side. And you're going to see individual slides that verify every single thing that I just told you. And he's going to say 
that all five rounds were fired within 0.934 seconds. That the first round was fired 0.358 seconds after the glass was broken. That Gross was a person going towards the car. Car ever went towards him. That when he broke out the right rear window of that car, he did so at exactly 11, 18, and 36 seconds. 0.934 seconds later, he's going to tell you the other five rounds were fired. And then he's going to tell you this. By using side-by-side -side comparisons, audio spectrograms, it's really quite, quite amazing what he was able to do. And he's going to show you, no question, the Dahl Allen was driving to the left, away from those officers, away from them, not towards them. And shots three, four, and five were fired after the car had already passed the defendant. And one, two, after the car had already passed Tyler Gross. No reason to shoot. No reason to shoot whatsoever. Finally, we'll have a use of force expert, Dr. Philip Hayden. Dr. Hayden is a decorated Vietnam combat veteran, awesome service, distinguished service calls. And for Creek Tomb Lane. Wounded badly, evacuated. His public service doesn't stop there though. He becomes an FBI agent, initially stationed investigating violent crime, gang activity. After that, he becomes a SWAT member. The persons that engage in the most dangerous form of activity that police officers have to do. He does this for several years and eventually becomes a SWAT instructor, Quantico, to the FBI. Virginia, and does that for me to do. Later, he gets his PhD and continues to lecture all around the country on use of force principles. He's going to tell you that the defendant, to a reasonable degree of professional certainty, was out of control, was unreasonable that night, that he didn't have to raise his rifle up and fire those five rounds, that there was no reason to do that that if he could simply look to his left and seen Tyler Gross, he would have known there was no danger. He's going to tell you the reasons that you don't shoot in the, in the cars except extremely rare circumstances, such as if a car is about to run over a little baby or something. The first reason is, he'll tell you, is because if you engage a car, number one, you're wasting time that you could be getting out of the way. Number two, it's extremely difficult to hit a moving target like that, even if you wanted to. And number three, that if you do happen to hit the driver, that's even worse because now you've got an out of control car. And he's going to tell you that you run the risk of exactly what happened here. That if you're attempting to engage a driver, you can kill an innocent bystander. An innocent kid who had done absolutely nothing wrong. So we're going to show you. Tyler Gross was never in danger, ever. That even if the defendant had ever perceived that he was, that by the time he fired his first shot, he was behind the car, Tyler Gross was. No danger whatsoever. And the shots three, four, and five were fired after the car passed by. We're going to tell you that. We're going to show that. We're going to ask you to find a verdict of guilty for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon by a public servant for those rounds that were fired in that car. Could have killed, and only by the grace of God did not kill. And all Allen, Maxwell Severed, Kavon Edwards, Maxwell Edwards. We're going to ask you to find guilty of that as well. We're going to ask you to find guilty of stealing Jordan Edwards from his family, ending his life. He's guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slimes. Mr. Gill, the law will allow you to make an opening <coughs> statement, or you may reserve your right to do so. What says the defense? Thank you, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to reserve our opening statement until a later point in the trial. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Please be seated.